Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chapter 12. Chapter 12 is all about probability. So in this section, we're just going to look at the nature of probability. So some terminology that we're going to be using here. Uh, the first one is experiment. And this is a controlled operation that yields a set of results. An experiment can be, well, as we see here in this corner, rolling a die, rolling five die. Okay. It can also be flipping a coin, it could be uh, shooting a basketball, uh, lots of different things can be experiments. Now the outcomes are the possible results of an experiment. So in our die example, the possible outcomes would be the numbers 1 through 6, because on a six-sided die we have the numbers 1 through 6. If we're flipping a coin, your possibilities would be heads or tails. And if you're shooting a basketball, the possibility is, well, you make the basket or you don't make the basket. Now, an event is a specific outcome or set of outcomes. And typically, it's what you're looking for out of the experiment. So you could say, I'm going to roll a die and look for the event of rolling a 1. So that 1 would be the specific outcome. Now you could also say I'm going to roll the die and I'm going to look for odd numbers. Now we have a set of outcomes because it could be 1, 3, or 5. Today we're going to be talking mostly about empirical probability. And what this is, it's the relative frequency of an event. So frequency is how many times something happens. And relative means in relation to something else. And it's going to be always based on an observed experiment. So you don't just look at the die, you look at the actual experiment and how it played out over a certain number of trials. So we have a formula here. And this formula is going to guide pretty much everything we do in this whole chapter. So P is probability and E is event. So it's the probability that event E occurs. And this is going to equal the number of times that E occurred out of the total number of trials in the experiment. And so you can see that this is the relative frequency of E occurring in relation to the number of times the trial, uh, the experiment had been performed. Now, in any probability, it's going to be between 0 and 1. So a probability of zero means, in empirical probability, that the event has never happened because it would have occurred zero times out of how many times you tried it. And if we get a probability of one in empirical probability, that means the event has always happened, meaning the number of times the event occurred is the same as the number of trials in the experiment, meaning it's always happened and we would get a fraction of one right here. Now one other thing to note is if you're looking for the probability of not E, meaning the event does not happen, you can take 1 and subtract the probability that the event did happen. Okay, so it kind of has this relationship where the probability the event occurs and not occur adds up to be 1. And of course you could still use the probability formula by looking at the number of not E's divided by the total number of trials. Now another very important idea or concept in probability is something called the law of large numbers. And it says that probability statements apply in practice to a large number of trials, not a single trial. So it's right there, the law of large numbers. So we really can't apply any of this probability to a specific event. But uh, the relative frequency over the long run is predictable, but not a specific event. So basically it's saying, if I try this experiment many, 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 many times, like thousands of times, hundreds of thousands of times, this is the way it's likely to turn out. Alright, in our first example, a class has 27 students, 
one student is absent today. And if 22 students turned in their homework today, what is the empirical probability that the absent student will have their homework done when they return? Okay, so if we look at this, the experiment is, well, a student comes to class and do they have their homework? And the event then that we're looking for is has homework. Okay, so really what we're looking for is the probability that a student has their homework. So a lot of times in the event, we'll just write what the event actually is. So using our formula, we want the number of students who have their homework divided by the total number of trials, which would be the number of students. Okay, so for this experiment, 22 students had their homework out of how many students actually came to class. Well, there were actually only 26 students that came to class because the absent kid was not part of this experiment. So we're going to do 22 divided by 26, okay, which is 0.846. Now, sometimes you're going to see probability statements written as decimals, remember, between 0 and 1. Okay, a lot of times the textbook will leave it like this. But 0.846 probability is kind of a weird way to talk about that. So I like it if you change it to percentages. And so this is going to be 84.6%. Okay, so the probability of a student having their homework is 84.6 percent. Okay, now the question is saying, you know, what's the empirical probability that the absent student will have their homework? Now I realize that probability cannot predict a specific event, but what we can say is that the probability the student has their homework is 84.6 percent. Now notice the student will either have their homework or not have their homework. So obviously, the probability cannot predict whether they have it or not. It just shows the chance that they do. Okay, lots of other factors play into this. Okay, is this a student that typically turns in their homework? Maybe there's some other probabilities that would help us determine uh, whether or not they will have their homework. Now the next one, a cop sits at a speed trap and watches cars go by. In 30 minutes, he counts 22 red cars, 47 white cars, 34 black cars, and 12 blue cars. Okay, so in this case, uh, the experiment is, well, cars are going by, and we're going to see what color they are. Here, there's lots of different outcomes. We had red as an outcome, white as an outcome, black is an outcome, and blue is an outcome. So we want to know what is the empirical probability that the next car will be blue. Okay. So we would write this as the probability of blue is the number of blue cars over the total number of any car. Okay, so blue cars, there were 12 of them. Over the total number of cars, well, we have to add all these up right here. So we're going to have to add 22 plus 47 plus 34 plus 12. Okay, so 22 plus 47 plus 34 plus 12. It's a total of 115. So the relative frequency is 12 out of 115. And if we want to change this into a percent, we get 0.104 which is about 10.4 percent. Alright, our next example talks about the probability of not a white car. So what we want to do is actually figure out 1 minus the probability that it is a white car. Okay, because these have to add up to be 100 percent. 
So we're going to do 1 minus, well, the number of white cars, which is 47, over the total number of cars, which was 115. Okay, so we're going to do 1 minus 47 divided by 115. And it gives us 0 0.591 or 59.1%. Okay. So it's going to be important to start thinking about how these questions are asked. It's, it's always going to say, what's the empirical probability? So that means it's based on an experiment. We need some actual hard data numbers. And then that the next car will be. So next car means, well, what is the probability? And then it gives you an event right here. All right, let's move on to our next example. It says Vlad hits a home run for his last nine at bats. Who's Vlad, you say? Well, he used to play for the Angels. Replace that with whatever baseball player you like. As that may change from year to year, we'll just say it. Baseball player hits a home run for his last nine at bats. What is the empirical probability of hitting a home run? Okay, so we want the probability of hitting a home run. Okay, so it's going to be the number of home runs over the number of at-bats. Okay, so how many home runs did he have? Well, there was one out of a total of nine at-bats. And you guys know the trick dividing by nines? It's always going to be this number as a repeated decimal. So one-ninth is actually going to be point one one one, And that would just repeat. So it's about 11.1%. So if it was two-ninths, notice it would be point two 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 repeating. 3 ninths would be 0 0.3 repeating. And we can see that's 1 third, so it makes sense. Okay, so a little bit of math fun there for you. So anyway, the probability of him hitting a home run empirically so far is 11.1% because it's based on what happens. So let's say he's gone 8 at-bats now without a home run. Will he hit a home run in his next at-bat? So, at-bat, no home run, no home run, no home run, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so he's gone eight at-bats without a home run, where before he had hit one out of nine. So what's going to happen on that ninth at-bat? Will he hit a home run? Okay, well, if you've ever watched baseball, the answer, of course, is not necessarily. Okay, so it's not no, it's not yes, it's not necessarily. Because when he comes up to bat, notice he has two options. He can hit a home run or he cannot hit a home run. He always has these two options every at bat that he takes. So empirical probability is more about describing what has happened in the past as well as what will happen in the long run, but it cannot predict a specific event. Okay, so you might want to add this note here. It can't predict a specific or individual event. Okay, over the course of a season though, that's going to give us a better predictor of the probability of him hitting a home run. So what managers do is they look at all of these statistics and basically they treat them like probability. So probably what's going to happen in the long run? Well, this guy hits more home runs than that guy, so I'm going to put this guy in the lineup. So you can use probability to impact your decision making.
Our next example is a perfect uh, example of that. It says, of 35 new restaurants in a chain, 21 were closed within a year. So find the empirical probability of a restaurant surviving. So the probability that a restaurant survives, empirically, it's based on what's happened. So how many restaurants survived here? Well, 21 closed, so we're going to do 35 minus 21. And so that means 14 survived. So the probability of survives, well, 14 survived out of 35 restaurants. So the probability is 0.4. Or another way we can say is that 40% survive. Now, is this a lot of restaurants? Well, it, it is. It's a lot of restaurants. Maybe not as many as you'd want to go making all of your decisions based off of. But the law of large numbers says the more trials that we have, the more reliable this is going to be over time. So what we'd like to do now is say, how many restaurants would we probably need to start if you wanted to have 125 restaurants survive? Well, if 40% of them survive and we want to have 125, we could say 40% or 0 0.4 of how many restaurants equals 125. Okay, so to get this answer, we're going to divide now by 0.4. So 125 divided by 0.4. And we have 312.5 is our answer there. And because we're talking about actual restaurants, we're going to round that up to 313 restaurants. Okay, so does this mean if I start 313 restaurants that 125 will survive? No, what it means is probably 125 will survive. Okay, so that's empirical probability.